Good afternoon and welcome to Politico Live. We're so pleased to be here with our special guest Thierry Breton, who needs no introduction for the first Politico event of the year. My name is Nick Vinicor. I'm Politico's pro editor overseeing the subscription services and you're watching Politico Live. Here we are, year three of the pandemic in an economic crisis with the French presidency beginning here in Brussels uh, and so much on the table in terms of policy decisions and changes uh, this year. We have so much to discuss uh, with the commissioner um, <clears throat> and we will be getting into all these newsy subjects to, to launch the year with, with plenty of, uh, of, of new things. Um, but before uh, I start, I wanna start with a few housekeeping remarks. First of all, I'd like to warmly thank our partner Etno for making this event possible. Thank you to our audience here in person. It's great to see real faces in person uh, and also watching online. Uh, um, we want to make this event as interactive as possible for everybody watching. You can participate by tweeting at Live Politico and ask questions via Slido, slio.do, using hashtag Politico Breton. Uh, you can already share your thoughts about uh, uh, what we're doing uh, and <clears throat> answer the poll that we have uh, titled, Think of Technology and Inno Innovation, How Ambitious is the EU? I'll be reading out the results at the end of the interview. And before we dive into this hopefully very newsy interview with Mr. Breton, uh, I'd like to welcome our partner Etno, uh, as Director General <clears throat> Lise Fur, to the stage for some welcoming rem remarks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Nick, and good evening to all of you. Thank you to the Politico team and to Commissioner Breton. I speak to you as Director General of Etno. Since 1992, we represent the telecom operators who contribute to investing 50 billion euros per year into the digital future of Europe. We are technology companies with a fully European history and DNA. I want to share with you three things that just happened and that call for Europe to further step up its actions. I also want to th share three positive things that changed the European attitude to technology. Let's start from the three big things that happened recently. The first thing is that we started realizing the effects of the global tech turmoil. I think of the so-called US-China tech decoupling, a phenomenon that stretches from apps to 5G and semiconductors. Consequences are expected to be so real that a 2021 IMF paper predicts a fall of global trade as a result, one that will likely affect Europe more than US. The second thing that happened just this November is that the US companies started a new gold rush to conquer the so-called metaverse. If we look at hardware alone, the FT expects over 45 million metaverse terminals by 2025. Many of the market leaders were in display last week in Las Vegas at the CES. The third thing that happened is we came to an even clearer realization of how today tech power equals unre unreviled corporate power. On January 3rd, Apple became the first corporation ever to hit the $3 trillion capitalization. As European corporate leaders, this calls for a question. Which role do we want to play uh, in Europe in this scenario. The past years have brought about change in how EU sees itself in the global tech landscape. I have reasons for confidence. The first thing that changed is the EU political approach to technology. Since the new commission took power, the EU started to be very serious about industrial policy we see a stronger political focus on investment, from semiconductors to 5G, data, cloud, and edge computing. 
But we also see less naivety on the relationship with big tech. The DSA, the DMA, are there to testify it. The second thing that changed is that Europe started seeing the interplay between digitalization and the Green Deal. If we're serious about that, it can be big also in terms of leadership in innovation. No other geopolitical entity has the same level of attention as the EU has to CO2 emissions. This is one where the EU can lift its partners, including the US, in adopting technologies like 5G, AI, and digital services as a lever for decarbonizing traditional sectors. The third thing that changed is that policymakers are starting to see telecom also as an essential enabler of digital innovation and growth and not only as a sector which to squeeze lower prices. But there is much more that policymakers can and should do. This is why I have a final message. I agree with Commissioner Breton when he recently said that there is a visible progress in the digital transition, but that we need new EU-wide efforts. As a telecom sector, our plea to policymakers is to go all the way in promoting investment and smashing the barriers to EU innovation. The work done in the past by the EU is important, but we still need the proactive involvement of all policymakers to make it happen, also in the top. As several telecom CEOs recently wrote in a statement facilitated by Etno, more can be done in the field of competition policy. More can be done in rebalancing the relationship between European players and tech giants. And more can be done in ensuring that national regulators embrace the pro-investment spirit of EU digital policy. Also, Telecom companies are there to help and to be vital, a vital part of the solution. To wrap it all up, our three reasons for confidence do not resolve the three reasons for worry. But we can use our acute awareness of global tech turmoil as a lever to be even more proactive in promoting European digital leadership. And with this, Thank you for listening, and over to you, Nick. Thank you so much, Lise, <laughs> for those remarks. Um, with that, I'm going to invite our guest, uh, Internal Market Commissioner Thierry Breton, to the stage for this political live conversation <clears throat> that we're, we're very excited about. Welcome, Mr. Commissioner. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start by jumping right into uh, the news. Um, you spoke to French media uh, not later than yesterday, I believe. Talked about a need for a 500 million, uh, 5 billion, 500 billion euro investment in the next generation of nuclear power. Um, now we know that some other EU countries uh, don't think that uh, the nuclear should get this investment, notably Germany. Um, how do you think these countries can be brought online? Should they? Mm -hmm. First, thank you very much for having me today, tonight, and, uh, and Happy New Year to all of you. Um, um, I, I, I don't think it is exactly uh, the, 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 the reality. You know, my job as a commissioner for internal market, uh, in other words, um, um, for industry and for companies, is to make sure that we will be able to accompany uh, all our industrial ecosystems, the 14 ecosystems, in this absolutely massive transition, probably the biggest ever. In the next 30 years, we need to change and to transform all our industrial ecosystem to make sure that that, that, will, that will get to the net zero in 2050. Right. And of course, in order to do this, we will need, guess what? Nuclear power. No, 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 no,
we will need electricity. Mm. So I made a calculation with my teams and with experts. Say, so look, how much do we need to achieve this? Of course, we have to take in consideration uh, hydrogen, we have to take in consideration mobility, electric cars, everything. And then we end with a rough calculation, even if it's precise, saying that we will need to double the capacity of producing electricity in Europe. Now, of course, we have to be pragmatical. How could we double the capacity to produce electricity mm -hmm. regarding where we start mm -hmm. and where we will end in 30 years? We start, since we, you spoke about nuclear, mm -hmm. at 26% today of our electricity in Europe being produced with 103 nuclear plants in Europe. 26% for electricity. And then we make all the calculations, including uh, integrating the speed uh, of uh, um, uh, the uh, renewable energy that we will implement uh, and, and everything. And there is no, and I think everybody agrees with that, no way that we will end probably at best at 15% by 2050 still in nuclear. But since we will need to double, of course, Mm. the capacity of producing electricity, it means that we will need at least to maintain or to increase uh, our production in nuclear energy. If we don't do this, we will just not be able to achieve. Right. Second thing, we made the calculation, then what it means? It means that we need to invest every year 60 billion euros for renewable for the next 30 years. 60 billion euros every year. We need to invest every year 45 billion, euro, billion euros for transportation of electricity within the next 30 years. And we will need to invest. Mm. And that's, of course, coming bottom up with the experts, not with us, 20 billion euros for nuclear. Right. So that's basically where you get this uh, need, which is not, again, coming from us. It's not an hope, it's not a wish, it's not whatever. It is just when you say we will reach net zero by 2050, mm. looking where we are, where we land, this, you transform, you, you, this is uh, um, uh, what we will need to do just to achieve our net zero. So, so to be clear, uh, for you, there's no way of reaching net zero without nuclear power. Absolutely no. And at a time when some countries are dismantling, the country we're in now are dismantling their nuclear nuclear power plants, how do you convince those countries to... Uh, you know, uh, first, I don't have to convince them. And I have to be very clear. My job as a commissioner is, of course, to give data, to give information, but also to respect the treaty. It's not our mission as a commission to give a direction of uh, what should be your uh, energy mix in every country. This belongs to the simple authority of the member states. Mm. So I don't have to comment. But you know, I just had a meeting before coming here tonight with the Prime Minister from uh, Belgium. Mm -hmm. And we spoke on many issues, the CHIP Act, but also of nuclear. And he told me, yes, of course, they have to stop, probably, uh, uh, their nuclear plants in 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 in, um, in Belgium, but they are thinking also to have new small reactors (SMR). So I mean, it's not me; it's just their vision to say there is no other way we'll be able to reach. So again, uh, it's not me; it is just the fact that member states mm -hmm. they have now opportunity to choose, and they will they will choose regarding their political constraints and everything. So, if you ask me if I have doubt that at the end of the day, um, uh, you know, we are still in the process of um, um, uh, working on this, uh, because now we, are, we presented our proposal yep. uh, just before uh, year end, mm -hmm. and now there's a consultation, and uh, before the end of the month, hopefully we will then uh, put this in the college and we will decide. So I have good hope that we will lead. We propose this, uh, this proposal. Mm. And I think that uh, then again, for this taxonomy story, right. uh, where of course, some countries will need to invest in nuclear, some other will need to invest in gas, mm -hmm. uh, we'll find a good compromise.
Okay, but will we with a, a compromise that will lead to net zero? Yeah. This is the only way probably to go to net zero, yes. Okay. Um, question that's closely related to that, we're in an energy crisis right now. You could argue it's linked to this question of, of energy. Inflation is up to what, up to 5% in, in December. What sort of tools do you have, does the commission have to address this for, for European consumers with energy prices soaring and, and those sorts of, of difficulties? Mm. But here again, uh, and, and energy are, are definitely in the hands of member states. Mm. This is exactly what we said. Mm. So us, what we can do is, of course, to, uh, to propose some tools. This is all, let's say, a uh, toolbox uh, to, um, um, to authorize uh, in this uh, very period uh, member states to ease the situation. Mm. Because we probably uh, uh, believe that uh, this situation will last probably for the next six months or something like that. Mm. Uh, we all know where it comes from. Uh, and especially from the strong demand from China, but not only, mm -hmm. and uh, and and probably we will need to be prepared to accompany here um, uh, the one who will need to be um, to be uh, helped in this uh, in this situation. So this is what the Commission can propose, right. but of course the Commission cannot uh, do something else. This is in the end of the member states. But you've been an innovator in that regard. Health policy was a national competence and. You were able to uh, put a, put ahead the, the vaccine strategy. Is this is there similar urgency here with inflation? Do you think the Commission needs to go further? What what could be offered? Well, inflation is another story. Even if of course the energy price, uh, the energy prices is yeah. a bit mm. is a bit a big part of it. Mm. But um, uh, um, it's true that we have some thinking. Uh, I know that some country put on the table the fact that we could uh, maybe um, uh, buy gas together or have uh, uh, joint storage uh, together. Uh, uh, personally, I think that what will be extremely important, if there is something that we can do at the level of the Commission in the mid-long term, is definitely to make sure that we, are, we have the right, inter the right interconnection mm -hmm. in terms of uh, electricity grid all over Europe. That's probably what we need. That's extremely, extremely, extremely important. For the rest, we will see. Um, uh, these are temporary uh, solutions. But the most important thing, uh, believe me, is to have uh, really Europe to be fully interconnected in uh, uh, electricity, and it's not the case yet. Mm. Do you think there can be the, uh, an economic recovery in this, these circumstances with inflation so high, or are we headed no, into a period of crisis? That's, that's no. a very important question. Uh, uh, of course, we see inflation everywhere. Mm. And we know that inflation uh, is starting to be more, um, let's say, sustainable, if I may say so, quote unquote, uh, when it is uh, transferred to salaries. And it's true that we start to see this, especially in the US, uh, but also now maybe in some countries. So we have to be very cautious. Personally, I'm a little bit cautious. Um, I'm not comfortable with inflation. I know that some um, uh, economists uh, say, oh, well, it's just for a few months. I believe it, it's, it's probably stronger than that. So we have to be prepared for that. And, and I know, uh, being, having been a uh, finance minister, that uh, it's not easy to, um, uh, to run the, the economy of a country um, in inflation. So we probably should be prepared. Of course. Right. Just want to remind the audience, you're welcome to, to keep asking your questions. We'll, we'll be taking questions from the audience too. Um, but. I want to get into uh, the question of strategic autonomy. Uh, you've uh, become known as a champion of the idea Europe should be more autonomous, more independent. And we're in the midst of a pretty ugly uh, dispute with China and, and Lithuania. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you, can the European Union work with Taiwan in Lithuania uh, to protect those investments? Mm -hmm. Well... <laughs> few comments, if I may say so. I don't like the word champion. <laughs> okay. Except in sport. <laughs> Except in sport. Mm. Uh, so uh, uh, I know that there's some stereotype. Mm. Um, you, you, have to, you have two nationalities. Huh? You are both, uh, uh, I think, uh, American. U.S. citizen and, and, and Sweden. That's right. I, I am also. I have two nationalities. I am French and Senegalese. So you could uh, you could choose. I don't <laughs> say that because you are American that you are uh, 
Atlantis. <laughs> so, I, I'm, 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 it's not because one of my nationalities is French that I'm a protectionist or a, 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 a champion of, uh, of, of sovereignty. Mm. I'm just working in the general interest of Europe. And it's true that in this, in this concept, I really think that uh, uh, a lot of things are becoming more and more geopolitical. And if there is something that we learned um, in this crisis, COVID-19 crisis, it is definitely that even with your best partners, uh, including the, uh, the US, and the US are our best partners mm -hmm. and our allies. Sometimes, uh, for, um, because of um, unexpected uh, situations, mm -hmm. they break uh, your partnership, right. they break the supply chains. Mm -hmm. And I had to deal with it, uh, uh, being in charge of the vaccine strategy, and you know that. You, you said the, the transatlantic relationship needed to be paused and reset. Well, uh, I, 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 I said that, that, that it's, it's true that we need to think uh, all our relations, including with our allies, um, at, um, at, at, at this regard. In other words, uh, we need to make sure that um, um, uh, for some specific supply chains, uh, could be in medicines, could be in semiconductors, and I'll come back to in a few minutes on your questions. Um, uh, we need to be able to exercise the right level of balance of power to make sure that we will be able to maintain the security of supply when it's needed. That's mm. exactly what I mean. And I prefer to present it this way than saying I'm a champion of this or that. I think everything, you know, I have been, uh, uh, I have been a CEO, I have been a minister of finance, and I always exercise the balance of power in my job. And it's extremely important. Uh, uh, and, 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 and in other words, it means that if you want to do what you have to do, you don't put your eggs in the same basket. And if you do so, I mean, you, are, you have to make sure that you will be able to balance it. In other words, a lot of things are becoming more and more geopolitical, including, by the way, what uh, you described. In Lithuania and Taiwan. So here, of course, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, we see exactly what, uh, what's happening. Do, are we able to work with uh, Taiwanese companies? Of course, yes. And we are working with Taiwanese companies. And, uh, and, uh, and we will continue to work with Taiwanese companies, of course. Uh, uh, but for the rest, uh, we have to make sure that uh, we are engaging with all our partners at uh, the right uh, uh, balance uh, uh, um, uh, situation. And, uh, um, and, uh, and, and that's why, regarding what's happening in, um, in, um, in Lithuania, uh, yes, uh, um, I, I, I say again that uh, there is absolutely zero issue uh, for us in Europe uh, working with Taiwanese companies and uh, we'll continue to do that. Thank you. I'll take one from the audience here since we're on the subject of, of chips. Uh, here is Mesut who asked us, uh, will the European Union still be dependent on China and Taiwan for final chip products in three years? Why three or four or five? I mean, uh, mm. uh, 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 m m m you know, working with uh, um, um, chip, since you follow uh, technology and you follow what we are doing, you know that uh, since the very first day I joined the Commission, mm -hmm. um, uh, I have been very vocal saying that we need to increase our capacity to produce uh, the right level of chips in Europe. And I've been constantly saying that since the very first day I joined the Commission. Because it's true that uh, uh, still today, 80% uh, of the production of chips are made in, um, in, in um, Southeast Asia. Right. And of course, um, it's, uh, um, it's becoming to be uh, uh, dangerous for us in terms of supply for us and for the US. And we are exactly at the same level uh, with our uh, US friends, 10% uh, in the US, 10% in Europe being uh, manufactured. And, and, and we believe that it's not sustainable. And this is why uh, we propose, and it has been accepted and voted, uh, that uh, by 2030, uh, we will need to be able to produce 20% uh, of uh, the global needs or at the worldwide level uh, in Europe. But since we double at the same time uh, the demand, mm. it means that we need to multiply by four the capacity of production in Europe. And it takes time. It's not something easy to do. So uh, uh, if you uh, ask me uh, in 10 years, my answer is yes, definitely. Mm. But to build uh, um, a, a plant uh, uh, from scratch, it takes uh, roughly four or five years. Mm. So uh, this is what we are doing now, especially with the European Chip Act 
to make sure that uh, we will have the right tools, like mm -hmm. our, our uh, US are doing with the US Chip Act. It will be probably something not too far from it. Uh, we have a lot of interaction with uh, um, our US partners on this, but also with what's happening in Japan or in Korea. Mm -hmm. I think here also we need to consider level playing field mm -hmm. with um, uh, our partners uh, slash competitors. And, um, and, and also to make, we have to make sure that we'll be able to produce what is necessary for the future market. And you know that uh, I've been here also very vocal on the fact that we need to uh, be able to produce below five nanometers uh, technologies, mm. which will be extremely important for everything coming uh, into the edge computing, uh, beyond 5G, uh, health, yeah. and, uh, and, and everything. So the answer is... Uh, uh, here also, uh, we will need. We will probably will continue to have some shortages within the next uh, 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 few quarters in semiconductors. Then we will catch up. This is a cyclical industry, as you know. Mm -hmm. And and mid time, of course, uh, we are working extremely hard uh, to uh, to propose. And uh, President von der Leyen is extremely uh, active on this. Mm -hmm. uh, she was vocal. She, she was vocal in. Uh, uh, State of the Union uh, um, uh, speech, and uh, she's pushing us uh, hard uh, to make sure that we'll be able to propose this in the following weeks. Okay. Well, since we're here, it's the first sort of proper uh, news event in Brussels. I wanted to ask you, what, what can you tell us about the European CHIPS Act that we don't know already? What, what is something that is going to happen this year? Uh, it's an ambitious title, and we, we don't know the, the fine Well, first, oh. first, we are working for more than one year on this subject. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and as, as I told you, um, um, uh, we have been um, uh, engaging with uh, all the European players uh, for more than a year now. Uh, uh, we, we, we identify pretty well what is needed uh, to uh, fulfill our requirements. Our objective is not, again, to do everything on our own. Our objective is to make sure that we'll be able to secure the supply. Again, here also to install the right balance of power. Uh, we are extremely strong, as you know, in Europe in research and development with IMEC, not too far from here, with Leti, in mm -hmm. the, uh, CEO Leti in France, in Grenoble, with Fraunhofer Institute, uh, to mention a few uh, uh, R&D centers in Europe. We're extremely strong also with an ecosystem around uh, ASML, not too far from here, to build the robots. Uh, to design the, the plants, and uh, so we are uh, uh, we are uh, extremely strong, mm. but we need to be able to produce more on our, our, our soil for us, and also to export to benefit from this huge wave uh, right. ahead of us. So, what could we expect? So, we are working now hard to finalize uh, uh, this um, chip act, uh, and then uh, to propose it to to member states. Uh, hopefully, it will be done in the next, uh, in the following weeks, um, uh, under the French presidency, and uh, then, of course, uh, uh, we are, we will welcome uh, because we will have, uh, let's say, three pillars. Um, uh, the first one will be to make sure that we will have the right level of R and D, and uh, we would like to work more um, uh, in cooperations with uh, all R and D centers to have the right platforms between the main uh, R&D centers, including to, an, uh, to, include, to include a pilot lines uh, um, in uh, um, leading edge technologies, um, a fund for start startups, uh, and, and so on. Second one, of course, will be to make sure that we will uh, be able to welcome uh, mega fabs uh, with the right level of security uh, for us, for security of supplies. And uh, the third one will, have, will be to have the right uh, level of uh, international cooperation uh, uh, between Europe and, 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 and other partners. And overall, of course, we will need to mobilize a significant amount of money. And so we are working on that. We have a very strong appetite for many member states. And um, the Commission will be able also to put some money on the table. So that's where we are. Mm. But we are um, pretty close now. Your friend, the CEO of uh, Intel, uh, has already showed interest. Uh, is talking about spreading investments between France, Germany, Italy, some some other member states to to help build up this capacity. As a as a business person, do you think that's the best way to go to spread these investments around, or or should we simply uh, pour them into one place in one country where the capacity is is going to be strong? Well, uh, you know. Um, 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 you, 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 we are a continent, mm. and uh, since you speak about Pat Gesinger, 
um, he, he, he doesn't put all his investment in Arizona. Uh, he, he has other places uh, uh, in the state of Washington, uh, maybe in Albany now, uh, in, 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 uh, in Florida. So uh, I think uh, it makes sense. It makes sense uh, to spread uh, some of your investment uh, uh, all over the continent. Mm -hmm. And it would be a mistake to do everything in the same place. They don't, uh, he, he doesn't do this in, 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 in the US, so I don't see why he will do this in Europe. Uh, and uh, this being said, uh, it's true also that regarding the ecosystems, you know, what do you need? Uh, uh, you need competencies to build a, a mega farm, you need a good level of um, uh, energy, stable, right. here again, mm -hmm. come back on electricity. And, uh, and, 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 and skills, I said, that's extremely important. So it's good to do this where you have already the um, uh, competencies. Um, uh, and then you could, of course, differentiate. You could put uh, fab somewhere. You could put some packaging uh, elsewhere. You could be, put some R&D uh, in a third place. I think this is what uh, he's oh, contemplating okay. to do now. Great. Another thing you've uh, announced on that is, a, is an industrial alliance on, on microchips. Uh, to, to really foster. Um, question is, will you invite foreign uh, corporations to, to be a part of this alliance uh, from China, from the United States? Will they be welcome in the alliance? No, the first thing, of course, mm -hmm. is to know exactly between us what we want to do, mm -hmm. where we are, and to make sure that we understand uh, 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 what we uh, really want to do. And then, of course, this is the main purpose of the Alliance, to start and, and to establish, and we have a lot of discussions, the right vision. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, we will welcome uh, um, uh, the partners, including non-EU non partners, uh, to uh, help us to fulfill this strategy. Should there be but criteria? Should there be well, conditions? No, no I, mean, I mean, you know, mm. here again, mm. we are totally open. Mm -hmm. And we are an open continent, but at our conditions. We put some conditions, mm -hmm. but we are open. So now we are defining the, the conditions, mm -hmm. and then of course we will welcome everyone. Right. But we are, doing, we are doing things at the right uh, place, I believe. Because there is a risk, right? We, we reported very closely on the story of Gaia X, which is a European uh, cloud federation where it was very open and foreign companies got involved. And then there ended up being a split within the senior members of this board over the role of foreign corporations, including, is, is that not a risk? Well, that, you know, no, no, but GAIA-X was really, it was really definite, uh, uh, I mean, we, it, it was important to, um, uh, to, to, to establish a good understanding of what we want to do. Uh, uh, and then of course, uh, uh, we are doing things now in cloud with uh, uh, um, a more uh, specific needs, especially uh, in uh, defense or health. But I think uh, uh, it's working well together. It's not exclusive. Mm -hmm. And here again, coming on the chip, uh, you know, uh, uh, our strategy is pretty clear. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago uh, Intel. Mm -hmm. uh, Yes, probably. Uh, probably, if uh, if it, if uh, Intel is willing uh, to benefit from the Chip Act, yes, Intel will be uh, welcome. But mm -hmm. we did not ask Intel to design our strategy. We did it ourselves. It's our job, and then we invite. It could be others, but we know exactly what to do, including with some condition to be able to make sure that we will uh, um, uh, um, uh, have always along the chain the security of supply, which is extremely important. Right, and, and one of the things you've put forward to secure security of supply is, is an emergency tool, new powers uh, to protect European supply chains, uh, to make sure that we have uh, in the healthcare sector and other sectors. Could you tell us a little bit more about, about those tools and how far you might be willing to go to, to protect uh, well, supply chains? Uh, two things. Um, the first thing is that, um, sorry to come back on this, but you know, I've been in charge of the vaccine strategy of the EU uh, beginning of February last year. 
And uh, one of my first discussions I had was, of course, after visiting all the factories and everything, making sure that we, we, we could be able to supply all our European factories in our vaccine. And of course, we had a lot of our factories in the European factories uh, being located in the US. And unfortunately, because of the DPA that the US had put in place, um, uh, de facto, uh, the US uh, blocked the export of our own components uh, to uh, Europe. So I had to interact myself with uh, Jeff Zayans, my counterpart, and they said, look, I'm sorry, but I can't. And I said, look, but this is my factory, this is our factory, yeah, but I can't, we have the DPA. And then, and then of course, um, um, I, I came back to the college and... Uh, uh, we had a discussion, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that finally my, my colleagues uh, uh, decided to follow my, uh, my wish to have an instrument uh, to say that uh, uh, we will export also uh, with everyone, of course, like always, mm -hmm. but as long as we have reciprocity. If we don't have reciprocity, we will not. And then when I put this tool uh, on, the, on the table, um, I started to discuss again with my friend Jeff Zayans and he started to reopen our supply chains. Mm. My point is that, uh, of course, we uh, in the US, um, uh, they, they are smart enough to have a DPA. Mm -hmm. Maybe a good idea that we, we, we have a DPA also, like the US. Right. Defense I think Production so. Act? Is that yes, and, 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 and this is exactly what they used. Mm -hmm. for, and I think it's a pretty good idea. But you found a bit of leverage in that discussion, didn't I you? Had, where that's there that's was the balance of power. Right. That's what I call the balance of power. But I did, we, we know we have the same thing with China, we have the same thing with everywhere. Mm -hmm. But I think that coming back to your, to your question, mm -hmm. I think um, uh, uh, the DPA that the US has, have put in place is probably an appropriate tool uh, uh, in today's world. And I think it will be good that the Europe, as a level playing field, uh, uh, develops this, this tool mm -hmm. like the US did it. Right. Um, and it's not protectionist. Huh? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, we're in a situation now in Europe where it's very hard to order a, a car, for example. Uh, we ordered one to bring my daughter to school, and it's been delayed and delayed, and now it's going to come in, in Q2 sometime. Is this the sort of situation we could have avoided, uh, this shortage, of really extreme shortage of chips and of, of supplies with something uh, like this, had we acted faster and more strongly? Uh, no, that's really something that's a very, very, very important question because, again, um, um, uh, you know, all my life I have been very careful not to have too many... Uh, the, the way to, I went very careful as a Minister of Finance to... Um, um, uh, and by the way, in France, I, I'm the one probably who privatized the largest bigger of companies ever. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 um, uh, I, I think we have to be careful that the weight of states are, um, uh, are at the right level. And uh, if I think so, is that uh, because um, uh, here in the actual crisis of semiconductors, it is definitely um, a, a lack of, um, uh, uh, let's say, um, av availability. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, the actual factories in uh, in, um, in 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 Europe, but um, um, and that's why we need to make sure that it will be the companies who invest to catch up. It's right. not the public money which should do that. But on the other hand, let, since you speak about cars, mm -hmm. um, I start to have some indication that in some countries. Uh, you have some car manufacturers uh, who still have a zero issue of uh, chip supplies. They are not, uh, by the way, European car manufacturers. They are Asian car manufacturers. And uh, uh, the chips uh, um, uh, suppliers coming from the same countries uh, seems to uh, not to restrain uh, any, uh, any demand. Uh, but they do for others. Mm. So we need to uh, investigate here a little bit. Right, right. We'll, we'll follow up there. Uh, another big thing that you've been at the helm of this year has been the package of technology regulation. Here again, Europe, being the world's regulator, completed the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act in record time. First of all, um, these are supposed to go into uh, trialogues, interinstitutional dialogue by March, I believe. Um, are we going to stick to that very fast timeline uh, to, to get these approved? Mm. First, I will correct you a little bit. <laughs> mm. 
Europe is not the world leader in regulation. I'm working on this field <laughs> since I'm a baby. Okay. I wrote my first book here mm -hmm. in 19, 19, 1984. We know it, soft war. It's you, still on sale, I think, yeah. <laughs> and, you were, and you were not born. And, 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 and of course, then, sorry for the publicity, but it's in the past century. Uh, then I wrote uh, another book, many books, but another one was La Dimension Invisible. Mm -hmm. And this is where I spoke, it was in 90, 1990, mm -hmm. of the need to organize, not to regulate Nick, to organize our information space. And, and I mean, there's nothing wrong. It is just the job of us politicians to put rules in this space. That's a full book, already in 1990, mm. by Hazard. Now I'm in charge. And yes, to tell you the truth, the very first day I joined the commission, I said to my team, including here, Lucia and Terence, we need now to organize our information space on two dimensions. First, the economical part, to make sure that everything that we put for years and years and years in place to have fair competitions will be transformed in this information space or digital space. And then for us in society, the way we work, the way we use it to protect our democracy, to protect our children and so on. That's the DSC. And first, when I started to work, I started to work with a, 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 a simple act with the two sides of the same coin. And then finally, uh, we said it was probably more appropriate to have one side for the economical part, the DMA, mm -hmm. and one side for the societal part, the DSA. Mm -hmm. It's done. We did a very large consultation mm -hmm. for a year. We put this in place at the end of last year. Mm. And now, of course, uh, we are entering, uh, uh, the, as you know, the council voted for it, right. both, both um, unanimously. The parliament voted also for the DMA. It expected to vote for the DSA in the second part of uh, the month of January. Right. Mm. And we will start the trilogue tomorrow. Mm. Tomorrow is the first trilogue. Uh, so, um, yes. We'll First, I understand that in terms of um, speed and the standards of uh, the Commission, it's pretty fast. Mm -hmm. But there's an urgent need. And by the way, when I'm discussing with my uh, US friends, uh, and you know, all the uh, discussions they have in the Senate and the House and everything, they are all willing to do this because they have to do this. It is a job of politicians mm -hmm. to organize our way to live together. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not to regulate. It's just to organize. And, uh, and uh, yes, I, I mentioned uh, a few times that it was a little bit the far west. Yeah. Uh, uh, so um, uh, we will do it. And I hope that it will be done under the French presidency. So uh, uh, I have good hopes that uh, there is a strong momentum, mm. very strong willingness to do it. Uh, um, and by the way, uh, if it could be helpful for uh, other partners. I have engaged myself with many others, of course with the US, mm. but also with uh, uh, Japan, but also with Korea, but also with Singapore, with all, all, a lot of other partners uh, who could uh, maybe um, uh, benefit from what we do. Uh, uh, we don't say that uh, what we do is absolutely uh, uh, the best thing to do. It has been complex, but I really think that it will be a very important uh, uh, movement uh, um, uh, for, um, for all of us. You, you mentioned the US. They, they weren't too happy with uh, the DMA in, in particular. Do you worry about damage to the transatlantic relationship? Not at all. Oh. Not at all. And I had, I had this discussion uh, with uh, um, uh, Gina Raimondo. Not right. at all. Mm -hmm. uh, first, when I hear to all the platforms in the US, a lot of the platforms are extremely happy. Maybe the four biggest ones mm. believe that it will give them a little bit of uh, uh, more work to uh, adapt themselves. Uh, but you know, and I will be very uh, um, uh, honest with you, uh, um, uh, well, we put in place this TTC uh, between uh, Europe uh, Trade and Technology Council. 
Uh, well, uh, so far we will uh, we'll see what it gives. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's important to have a discuss to have a, 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 let's say um, a, a council where we can talk and exchange, and it's extremely important. But the proof is in, is in the pudding. We'll see what it gives. And then, of course, uh, coming back to um, um, to the reaction of um, uh, um, of the US, the first thing is that what I said to, to 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 Gina Raimondo very clearly: it's not against anyone. It is really for European companies and for European fellow citizens. It is our job. But of course, uh, uh, some US companies will be impacted. Some European companies will be impacted. Some Chinese company will be impacted. I mean, uh, it will it will just be our own rules. To organize our digital space, and of course you will be welcome to come, but you fulfill. And I said, by the way, to Gina, look, I've been working all my life. Also, uh, when I was not a minister of finance or when I was not a commissioner in um, in, in high tech companies, I mean, never I will come to see you to say, hey, you need to change your regulation to make my life happy. I mean, it doesn't right. work this way. Right. Um, I see that we're the, the time is 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 uh, winding down, so we're going to try to be uh, super focused. One thing I wanted to bring up with you: there was a interesting academic study that came out just before Christmas, which talked about uh, the EU and sort of applying its its own laws, basically applying infringement proceedings to European countries, and showed that. The appetite of the commission to do this had gone steadily down over the years, and there were fewer and fewer uh, infringement proceedings against uh, European countries. Um, do you think the EU can organize its space and project power if it's not enforcing these rules, if it's not being a tougher policeman of its own space? You know, again, you follow the treaty. Mm -hmm. Uh, just follow the treaty, and uh, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the EU has not uh, uh, its own agenda. The EU is just the result of the treaty. So there's no Which political change. Absolutely in... not. Mm. By the way, if there is no is less infringements, it's mm. also maybe because uh, countries are behaving uh, better and better. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Uh, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> and, uh, and and I believe so. Yeah. And I believe so. Because okay. I know that. But, but uh, so, really, I believe so. Mm. But uh, and, and 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 you know, I will give you some examples. Mm. Um, uh, during the um, the first phase of the COVID-19 crisis. A lot of countries started to infringe our regulations right. just by closing their borders. Mm -hmm. And of course, some of uh, my um, team members said, hey, Commissioner, we have a good case. You need to have. I said, Look, let's try to give a call first. And you know, I gave many calls. Mm -hmm. And it worked. And it worked faster. So I am a strong believer of the soft law too. Okay. Uh, and uh, and it's working too, so uh, it means that of course the EU uh, has tools, but there's many situations where you can solve the situations yourself by engaging, by discussing, and finally by finding the right solution, and then having the countries. And this is exactly what happened when I had to call uh, to talk with my uh, uh, friend Jeff Z um, uh, Jan Span. Uh, the former minister of uh, uh, health in Germany, close the borders, same thing in France, and finally they reopen it. Uh, but of course, it is also the same thing when I had discussions with uh, with uh, with, with uh, 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 big tech companies or the GAFAs, including, uh, you remember, with uh, um, um, uh, Netflix or others, sure. when, they, when we, we started to realize that they were using 40% uh, uh, of our bandwidth, could put at risk uh, uh, um, uh, all our, our capacity, uh, especially during the confinement, uh, to continue to, to work at home, uh, to study at home, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and I asked them just, hey, right. why don't you reduce to, pay, to, to, to move from HD to SD? Mm -hmm. And he said to me, uh, uh, had us things, uh, Thierry, I'll call you back in 40, 24 hours, and he called me back and said, Thierry, you got it, I will reduce, and gave us back 20% more bandwidth. So, I mean, I'm a strong believer also in, uh, in, in uh, this um, uh, uh, soft, uh, soft regulation. And when I was uh, um, a professor at Harvard, uh, my student, I, 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 of course, I, 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 
uh, I was teaching governance to my students, and I said that, of course, you have the regulations mm -hmm. and the hard law, but more and more you have also the soft law. It's true also for regulators. And I think we need more and more, as a mature organ more and more mature organization, we need to use this in the commission. Mm -hmm. and, and, and believe me, I think, I think things are changing uh, uh, a little bit in this direction, and I think it's, uh, it's going in, the, in, in the good direction. Are the DSA and the D DMA, are those going to be uh, soft rules or hard law? No, there will be hard law, of mm -hmm. course, mm -hmm. that's for sure. But of course then, uh, because, and, and you know, I, I was extremely vocal in the commission. And uh, some had not exactly the same uh, 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 vision than myself. I thought that if we want to be serious, we need to have a strong set of sanctions. And this is why, of course, we started to put uh, some, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, there is this uh, amount of money that you will have to pay, uh, 6 to 10 percent. Uh, and of course, maybe uh, um, uh, you, you can be forbid to, uh, to exercise uh, your activity for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted also to have a last set of sanctions, saying that if you continue, then we could order a dismantlement of your activities on our territories. Right. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, it has been accepted. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that I want to use it, but it means that it exists. And of course, if a company doesn't fulfill our own regulations, obligations, mm -hmm. then of course, you have a set of sanctions. But then of course, uh, uh, um, like uh, with the example I gave you for a uh, discussion I have with uh, Jeff Zayans, when you put on the table, uh, uh, your, um, I don't know, uh, your tool. Right. I don't, because your, I don't want your to big use. stick, you might say. <laughs> uh, yeah. With a, a bullet in it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's better to have a bullet in it, even if you don't use it, mm -hmm. than not to have a bullet in it. That's what I learned <laughs> as a former CEO and as a former finance minister. Right, right. Pick up the phone, but but carry a big stick. Uh, uh, working <laughs> this way. <laughs> right. Um, I want to get you on uh, uh, vaccines. Um, the ramping up of vaccine production has been, you could say, a, a kind of a, an achievement, a crowning achievement of, of your administration uh, with an enormous number of vaccines produced. Just quickly, is this mission accomplished for you? Do you think no. uh, it's not done? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not accomplished because, of course, um, uh, until the pandemic will be not over, it will not be accomplished because, mm -hmm. of course, we will need to probably to have uh, new vaccines. Uh, we will need to have uh, to adapt our uh, vaccines to uh, maybe new variants. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and to tell you the truth, my personal feelings, mm -hmm. it will be accomplished when we will be uh, able to, uh, to vaccinate or the planet, right, including Africa. Well, that's what I want to ask you. Including about. Africa, and this is not because uh, mm. I told you what I told you of my other nationality, but mm. I could tell you that we are when we see I see that we are at seven percent in Africa. Mm. It is really not acceptable. But Mr. Boton, should we should we share the recipe of uh, of the cake? Should we share the patents so that those no, vaccines can be first produced thing, indigenously? The first thing, the first thing mm -hmm. is to start to have factories. Mm. That's the first thing. I mean, this is not because you have free patents that you have a factory. Mm. This is exactly what I did when, I, when I've been tasked. The first thing I did when I've been tasked, is said, forget everything else. Start to go in the factories. I visited every single European country last year, mm. one by one, many times. Not only to go to see the governments, but to see the, to see the factories, to see the companies. So the, everything is starting by the production. And the problem and the tragedy that we have still now in Africa for such a big continent, just remind you that since we are talking about 2015, 2050, 40%, 40 percent of the population will live between Africa and Europe on uh, three time zones. I mean, that's, and, and could you imagine that we don't have factories of vaccines for such a big continent? So the first thing is to start to implement and to decide where we could put some factories. And this is where, what, what we did. So we have now four sites, one in South Africa, one in Rwanda, one in Ghana, and one in Senegal. Why did we uh, select this? And I was there. Because we have already an ecosystem existing. Uh, we have in Aspen in South Africa, 
We have an institute uh, pastor de Dakar in, in, uh, in Senegal. So we have already some uh, capacities, some doctors, some scientists. We have already an ecosystem. And we started already these factories. Mm. We did it, helping, of course, listening to what uh, uh, um, uh, our African friends need. And uh, hopefully uh, uh, within the next uh, uh, few months, maybe the end of the year, beginning next year, we will have these factories uh, starting um, uh, to produce uh, a vaccine which will be needed for this pandemic and for others uh, in Africa. That's the first thing. And then, of course, now we can start to discuss uh, of a technological transfer because we started these factories. And, of course, then we can start to discuss with the companies what do you do with your patents. But it's working this way. Okay. And, of course, mid-time, by mid-time, we need to give as soon as we can and to send vaccine because in between uh, we need to, um, to bridge the gap. And that's why there's an urgent need uh, with COVAX and with all this initiative and Europe is, is, um, is really uh, strong in it. But we need also to convince everyone, uh, other countries, uh, including our US friends, to do that. That's extremely, extremely important. So uh, uh, personally, uh, um, <laughs> when, when will I believe that uh, my mission here will be over? Mm. Uh, when uh, we will be able to achieve this? And, and, and just to end on this point, um, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, uh, we propose also, we have created a, a, a pretty strong team uh, within my organization with extremely dedicated people, fantastic people working now, knowing extremely well the manufacturing process uh, and uh, they have been extremely helpful uh, to, uh, to support of course at our level what has been done with, uh, with uh, 58 uh, uh, factories in Europe mm -hmm. and all the ecosystem. Now we are uh, um, um, ready to use also these skills uh, and to send them uh, uh, to, uh, to Africa and maybe to, uh, to South America to support uh, the ramp up of uh, these facilities. And that's, uh, that's something that uh, I would love to see um, to be accelerated in the coming months. Great. In the few minutes that are remaining, I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions. I'm not going to say yes or no, but uh, uh, a quick response uh, would be appreciated. Uh, the French President Macron the other day said that he wanted to emmerde, piss off unvaccinated people. Do you agree with that? Do you want to piss them off too? <laughs> he has been, um, he has been listened loud and clear. Been heard loud and clear. Does the pandemic stop this year? Is it the end of the beginning? Mm. I think it will continue, but we need to adapt, to adapt ourselves. What's one thing that really worries you about technology? That we miss the quantum wave. What's one thing you're very hopeful about? That we don't miss the quantum wave. After the commission, business or politics for you? Mm. Two books, two more books. One is already finished and one is in my mind. All right. And uh, finally, we've uh, dubbed you the multitasking commissioner because you seem to be everywhere. Question is, when do you sleep? How many hours do you get a night? I wake up every morning mm. at what time? 4.30. 4.30. But I go very early to bed. And, okay. and, and, and by the way, I'm not the multitask commissioner because I'm the multi, uh, I want to be the multitask commissioner. I just have to fulfill my uh, 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 responsibilities. And it happened that I'm a commissioner by hazard. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not shy to say that I'm not a, pl a, plan, a plan A, I'm a plan B as a commissioner. <laughs> so uh, as a plan B, when I joined the commission, all my fellow commissioners were already in place. And I had in one week to get ready, uh, to learn everything, and then to go to the parliament, which was not an, an easy ride. But still, I find the fact that I discovered, like you, that the task of this commissioner should be a multi-task commissioner. Internal market, media, tourism, industry, space, 
defense, mm. digital. That's what I inherit. <laughs> I just have to do the job. That's it. Right. Well, those are my questions. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Thierry Breton, with us today. Thank you for coming to Political Live. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Um, that's all for me. I think we can uh, step off the stage. I believe we have some closing remarks from our partner. Um, oh, we also have, I want to uh, talk about the poll. People have been uh, voting. And I will read out the results here. We've got almost 300 people. How ambitious is the EU? Uh, more than before, but US and China will stay ahead. 63% of our respondents believe they'll stay ahead. Um, I'm not sure which one. Ambitious, the EU can lead. Not ambitious enough, the EU will trail others. Uh, it's just 18%. Um, so that's... Uh, all for our chat. Um, thanks again for, for listening and watching, and I'll turn the floor over to uh, Lise. For, no, it's over, okay. <laughs> That's it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.